Closed circuit, Radio Free Europe. Recording day 32560. This is take three. The broadcasting industry presents They Speak for Freedom a program commemorating the 10th anniversary of Radio Free Europe. Good afternoon. I'm Don McGannon, and I've been asked to act as a kind of host for this program on Radio Free Europe. The broadcasting industry thinks Radio Free Europe is pretty important, as you can see from the brass that's turned out for this show. We have with us today Gordon McClendon, Leonard Goldenson of ABC, Robert Sarnoff, of NBC, Frank Stanton of CBS, and Richard Moore of KTTV in Los Angeles. From the talent end of the business, Howard K. Smith, Arlene Francis, and Martin Block. <coughs> We're also privileged to have with us today Mr. W. B. Murphy, president of Campbell Soup Company and chairman of the fundraising agency of Radio Free Europe. And on this side of me, Mr. Joseph Cavago, former mayor of Budapest. Also members of the Broadcasters Committee for Radio Free Europe is Mr. Dub Rogers of Lubbock, Texas, the Vice Chairman, Mr. Leonard Wrench of Atlanta, Georgia, and Mr. Pete Peters of New York City. The program you will see is about Radio Free Europe. RFE broadcasts something special. Their sponsor is you. And private Americans everywhere, corporations, unions, workers, teachers, and housewives. Their audience is 76 million people behind the Iron Curtain. Their competition is the vast propaganda machine of the Soviet orbit. Radio Free Europe is a lifeline of truth extended from the American people to the captive nations of Eastern Europe. On July 4th of this year, it'll celebrate its 10th anniversary, and that's why we're here. In this program, we're going to tell you these three things. First, what Radio Free Europe does. Second, how it does it. And third, what you can do to help as RFE closes its first decade and begins its second. The program comes at a very good time. The United States is dealing with a confident and aggressive Khrushchev who wants nothing so much as for the United States to agree to the status quo in Eastern Europe. A vote of confidence from the American people in Radio Free Europe will show our determination as a country to support the aspirations of the captive peoples for freedom. Here now is Mr. W. B. Murphy, chairman of the fundraising agency of Radio Free Europe. Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Don. Last January, I was privileged to visit Radio Free Europe headquarters in Munich and in Lisbon. After a day or two there, a kind of cold shiver goes down one's back. You know there's a vicious cold war going on. Come away with a tremendous feeling of respect for the job Radio Free Europe is doing. These are dedicated, high-caliber people. They live in austere circumstances. There are no office carpets, no drapes. These are the kind of people you and I would like to hire if we could. The work of Radio Free Europe began 10 years ago when Soviet Russia first installed their puppet leaders in East European countries, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria. Since that time, Radio Free Europe has operated constantly in making a vital contribution to the cause of freedom. Radio Free Europe was born of victory that turned into a stalemate. In 1945, Soviet and American troops joyfully embraced each other at the L. Immediately after the German capitulation, Winston Churchill, Harry Truman, and Joseph Stalin met at the Potsdam Conference outside the ruins of Berlin. Here, joy soon turned into despair. Stalin made it abundantly clear that the Soviet Union had no intention of releasing its hold on the territory it had conquered. One by one, the nations of Eastern Europe fell under the yoke of communist tyranny. First, Bulgaria then Romania, next Hungary, then Czechoslovakia, and Poland.
the map of Europe changed. Between Western Europe and the USSR itself, there emerged a new entity, a new buffer zone, five more satellite slave states of the Soviet Union. Across the body of Eastern Europe, there descended a Soviet-imposed barrier against free communication between East and West. The barrier was the Iron Curtain. The Iron Curtain is a tangible thing. It is real. You can see it, touch it, hear it. It is a barrier of observation towers and of barbed wire. A barrier of rigged newspapers, films, magazines. Of party line schools, unions, youth organizations. And of noise, the noise that a radio set makes when it's being jammed. It's tough to rip through such a curtain, but the job must be done. If the Russians are permitted a monopoly of communication, they have more than a good chance of turning Eastern Europe forever into a communist camp. In 1956, Comrade Khrushchev made his famous secret speech in which he bitterly denounced Stalin. The Russians tried to suppress the speech. But within one hour after verification of the text, Radio Free Europe had beamed it to each of the satellites. Last year, the Vice President, Richard Nixon, visited communist Poland. Satellite newspapers and radio stations gave the Polish people virtually no information about his trip either prior to his arrival or while he was there but RFE transmitted the full details of his itinerary. As a result, over a quarter million Poles turned out to receive it. And only last month, the satellite press accused the United States of blowing up a munition ship in Havana Harbor on the personal orders of President Eisenhower. Radio Free Europe immediately broadcast Secretary of State Herter's repudiation. There is a desperate hunger for the truth in Eastern Europe. On the surface, things may seem calm. A smiling Khrushchev is greeted by a smiling puppet. He receives the bread and salt of hospitality. Young people march by the reviewing stand. In the West, we are sometimes fearful that the people of Eastern Europe will be taken in. We worry especially about the youth, who don't remember how things were before the curtain fell. But events have taught us that the spirit of resistance remains. Events that took place in Poznan. in East Berlin. In Budapest. There is a hunger for freedom, a hunger for the truth in Eastern Europe. It is the job of Radio Free Europe to satisfy that hunger. How does it do it? This is a 300-foot radio transmitter in Munich. It is in operation seven days a week, 365 days a year, on 135,000 watt power. Each day it beams the truth to the satellites. Altogether, there are 28 transmitters in the Radio Free Europe network. Located in West Germany and Portugal, they broadcast almost 3,000 program hours a week. 18 hours each day to Czechoslovakia, Poland, and Hungary, about six hours a day to Bulgaria and Romania. Many of RFE's broadcasters are refugees from behind the curtain. 
editors, entertainers, workers, teachers, clergymen. They speak to their people in their own language, pole to pole, Czech to Czech, Bulgarian to Bulgarian. Tuk je radio Svobodna Evropa. Glasat na Svobodna Bulgarija. Aici je radio Europa Libera. Voča Romunije i Libere. Mubi radio Volna Evropa. Glas Volnej Polski. Hlasi sa vam hlas Slobodneho Československa. Rozhlasová stanica Slobodna Evropa. Information from all over the world pours into the newsrooms of Radio Free Europe. In Western Europe, ten news bureaus keep in touch with the latest developments. In New York, domestic news is sifted. In Munich, a staff of skilled audience research people dig for the facts behind the curtain. Interview refugees. Monitor communist broadcasts and newspapers. Search biographical files for detailed information about party members. Around the clock, Radio Free Europe personnel, almost 1,200 strong, analyze, correlate, probe for the truth, and report it. If there is corruption in Budapest, a case of police brutality in Warsaw, if a worker is cheated in Bucharest and Radio Free Europe hears of it, they send the news on. The backbone of the RFE programming schedule is hard news. Ten minutes of it delivered straight and unvarnished every hour on the hour. Other programs run the gamut from popular music to discourses on music and art. There are programs for every special group, farmers, women, youth, communist party members. The programs stress the captive people's national heritage, a heritage which the Soviets seek to repress. The programs hit the communists where they hurt hard. The letters that listeners behind the curtain send in, the stories of the refugees who managed to get out, are eloquent testimonials to the effectiveness of the broadcasts. And the communists themselves provide strong confirmation of RFE's impact. Over 1,000 communist jamming transmitters try to blot out the message of truth. To frustrate the Soviets, RFE beams each program on several frequencies simultaneously. 80 to 90 percent get through behind the Iron Curtain. All of this costs money, private money. It must be private money. Radio Free Europe is not a government operation. It's a private, non-profit organization supported by American citizens and corporations. The voice of America, as you know, is something entirely different. It's the broadcasting arm of the United States government. It's operated by government personnel, financed by congressional appropriations the official diplomatic voice of the United States government. It broadcasts globally in 38 languages and it reflects national policy. The voice of America can devote only a small share of its time to the satellite countries. But Radio Free Europe, because it's a private organization, can zero in with precision on the satellite countries. It can move faster in covering news events and it enjoys a greater flexibility in what it says. And it's free to cause a, call a communist lie a, a lie. And it's free to stand toe-to-toe -to, -toe to counter Soviet propaganda and get the truth across. Radio Free Europe's annual budget goal is $10 million, and it's money well spent, and not very much money at that. The Russians spend many times this sum in jamming, many times this sum in the troops that they maintain in Hungary, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and the other countries. Radio Free Europe makes a vital contribution to the cause of freedom. It's vital to the people behind the Iron Curtain because it persuades them that there is a way of life outside that's different from Soviet communism. It keeps 76 million once free people with us in their hearts and their minds. And it blocks their giving up to the communist ideology. And it's vital to American business. You will look at this map. You will see that these five countries are a big chunk of Europe. They extend from the Black Sea to the Baltic. They are, in effect, a buffer zone between Soviet Russia and Western Europe. 
To get a measure of the importance of Radio Free Europe, I think we have to recognize what would happen were Radio Free Europe to go out of business. In this case, the 76 million people of these five countries would have only one-sided, slanted propaganda. The lies of the communists would be unanswered. Gradually, over a period of time, whether this be one, 10, or 25 years, these people would be soaked up into Russia, just as Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia were. And then we would have Russia right on the border of Western Europe. Then over a period of time, we would gradually begin to find compromising between Russia and the free Europe countries. In any event, I'm sure we would find eventually that the whole of Europe would be in the Russian orbit. This is Soviet Russia's obvious plan, as you can well realize. They've announced it as such. This would make a situation very unhealthy to American business and very dangerous to the United States. But I've been speaking from the viewpoint of someone on the sending end of Radio Free Europe. How does it feel to be on the receiving end? Mr. Joseph Cavago can tell you. Mr. Cavago is a Hungarian an engineer who spent six and two-thirds years in a communist prison. Before that, he was in a Nazi prison. Between imprisonments, he was on two occasions mayor of Budapest. He escaped from Hungary and another prison sentence shortly after the Soviet tanks came in to crush the revolt. The punishment he took in prison is hard to comprehend, but he never turned his back on his belief in freedom. He can tell us something about the effectiveness of Radio Free Europe. I was there, I listened to the Radio Free Europe. During the long years when I was imprisoned by the communists, my wife did so. My friends, all my acquaintances listened to the Radio Free Europe. And I have to tell that is the radio of the masses behind the Iron Curtain. Why? People are hungry to know what is going on in the world because they want to have hopes that they will survive. They cannot get objective information through the communist press and radio because they can get only just one side of the events going on in the world, which is advantages from the communist point of view. So they need the other star side of the story. They want to know what is going on. The free world cannot give physical freedom at the moment to the people behind the Iron Curtain, but the people of America can supply my nation and other nations by the Iron Curtain is the most basic human right, that is the right to be informed. Living in this country, three years along, I know that it does not mean anything to people living in a free country. But behind the Iron Curtain, to be informed, that is the greatest thing. I feel that we can do this. I would like to point out that we got good objective information through the Radio Free Europe, even during our revolution. But it never fomented, never instigated our revolution. It was a spontaneous national uprising. Nobody prepared, nobody premeditated. It just came. It came from the heart of the people. Why? Because the bitterness stored up in the heart of the people during these long years of terrible oppression. It blew out as a volcano erupts. I apologize for my poor English. Thank you, Mr. Cavago. And my, now may I ask you just one question. How long do you think we can keep the hearts and the minds of the satellite peoples with the free world? <clears throat> we can keep them as long as they are kept informed of the free world. Only three or four percent of the whole population is really communist. Well, that's a fine rundown on Radio Free Europe, as I've ever heard. What I'm hoping now is that all Americans everywhere will receive as good a briefing, and I'll now get down 
to a point regarding Radio Free Europe and what it is doing. And of course, what it is contributing. The broadcasting industry, you and I, all of us, will do our share. Here are three men who will tell us a little bit about that part of it. First, Leonard Goldenson. Thank you, Don. And uh, <coughs> as important and rewarding as it is to Americans, bro broadcasting is even more important to the peoples behind the Iron Curtain. As Americans blessed with a free public opinion and free mass media, we cannot fully appreciate what Radio Free Europe means to its listeners in the satellites. To them, broadcasting is more than entertainment, more than information, more than news, more than cultural enrichment. In addition to these things, it is hope, truth, encouragement, intellectual and moral sustenance. As broadcasters, it is our responsibility to do whatever we can to see that such sustenance is not denied them. Now, Robert Sarnoff. We broadcasters are called upon day in and day out to serve many good causes, and I think we do a pretty good job of it. Today, we are mobilizing for a cause in which we hold a special stake, not only as Americans and men of goodwill, but as members of the broadcasting industry. Of all the public service efforts that claim our support, Radio Free Europe is the only one which is itself an arm of broadcasting. While it speaks to the satellite countries with the truth and the reminder that we Americans have not forgotten them, it speaks to America and all the world of the unique power of the broadcasting medium. Of all the media of information, only broadcasting can do the daily job of getting through to the satellites so swiftly and thoroughly. Now let's show what kind of a job broadcasting can do in this country to raise funds that make this extraordinary service possible. Now Frank Stanton. The world is sick and tired of governments that push people around, belaboring them with propaganda, using them as so many pawns in intercontinental power plays. The strength of Radio Free Europe derives from its expression of a free people's concern for entrapped fellow human beings across the seas. Its usefulness consists in the concentrated, informed effort of those people to do something about the unhappy fate of their fellows on a practical, effective level, the spreading of truth. Nothing is more important about Radio Free Europe than, it, than that it reflects the convictions of as many of the American people as hear about it. This is where we in broadcasting can help. We have access to virtually all American homes. I hope that all of us will take this opportunity seriously to do all that we can to inform our listeners and viewers about Radio Free Europe. This is not a gift to anyone. It's in our own self-interest because it is in the interest of all of our own freedoms. For 10 years, the American people have supported Radio Free Europe on whose round-the-clock broadcast the people behind the Iron Curtain depend for the news and opinion of the world. These captive people are concerned lest our search for peace we evidence a loss of interest in them. In the course of going to summit conferences, the American people will forget them and lose heart in their support of Radio Free Europe. Now is the time for every American to speak up, to show the captive people that they are behind Radio Free Europe, and this means we must talk about money. Besides talent, you know, there also is the matter of dedication and courage and hard work. That's what it takes to keep Radio Free Europe going. And all of it, every dollar, has got to come from private citizens. That's where the broadcasters come in. We're going to help raise that money. Our big push, the broadcasters for Radio Free Europe, will be made during a two-week campaign which begins on April 24th and ends on May 8th, both days inclusive. The campaign is being launched to stimulate public awareness and interest in RFE as a vital and continuing force in the east-west balance of influence and to reaffirm the American position of friendship and loyalty to the people behind the Iron Curtain on the eve of the summit conference. And of course, to bring in the money. Within the next few weeks, you'll be receiving Radio Free Europe kits. This is a do-it-yourself campaign kit, especially prepared for broadcasters. 
In it, you'll find spot announce announcements, live tapes, film, tele-ops, scripts, discs, the whole works. The most important thing you'll find is the background material on Radio Free Europe itself. Material that will explain in detail the purpose and importance of the job Radio Free Europe is doing. Please study this material carefully so you can explain it in your own words to whomever you must talk to about it. Why Radio Free Europe is vital to all of us. Because by your personal endorsement, plus the above commercial announcements, you will combine and provide the most effective means of presenting our message to your listening public with impact and understanding. Well, you've heard from the bosses. Now let's hear from the other guests. Howard K. Smith. Radio Free Europe was organized in 1950, and its story over that decade since then has been a very proud one. It's been the story of a significant contribution to the cause of freedom. I've been privileged to be able to report most of that story over the years, and I hope I will be able to continue to report it in the future. For every mention of RFE's activities is a contribution to the kind of world we want and the kind of world I'm persuaded most other people want. As newscasters, we want to do all we can to support Radio Free Europe's campaign. And now, Miss Arlene Francis. What should talent do to help Radio Free Europe? Well, of course, it should do whatever it can. But in specific, I think it means doing things like giving a performance when it is needed, uh, giving a plug when it is requested, calling attention to RFE's campaign at a concert or a show or at a community event. It certainly seems little enough to do. Those people over there have it very rough indeed. And they're tooting for us. The least we can do is root for them. And Martin Block. Well, I'm sure that most of us disc jockeys are pretty much alike. When we get an exciting record that we think our listeners will enjoy, we play it over and over again. I have just a very few words for my brother disc jockeys. When you receive your Radio Free Europe kit, you'll find a very good record, a record that'll not only please your listeners, but help people all over the world. Just as sure as I'm sitting here, I know we can count on you to let your listeners know about the great work of Radio Free Europe. RFE conveys a message, and it does it with the sweet music of democracy. Let's give this one all we've got, huh? Well, that's the story. We've talked about Radio Free Europe and what it does, how it does it, and what we can do to help it. Now is the time for everyone here, every broadcaster in the business, to speak up. The whole broadcasting industry, which enjoys the freedom of speech in this country, they want you to join in saluting the free broadcasters of Radio Free Europe with a great chorus from millions of Americans saying, well done, keep up the good work. Now is your chance to speak up. We want and need your all-out support. We want you to use on your stations and the radio and television material, which will be sent to you very shortly. We want you to put on a saturation campaign during the period of our special drive, April 24th through May 8th. Let's show the people behind the Iron Curtain the way we feel about freedom of speech, free journalism, free radio, and free television. Speak up, America. The American broadcasting industry has presented They Speak for Freedom, a program celebrating the 10th anniversary of Radio Free Europe. You've heard from W.B. Murphy, chairman of the fundraising agency of Radio Free Europe, and Joseph Cavago, former mayor of Budapest. In the broadcasting industry, you heard from Don McGannon, Frank Stanton, Robert Sarnoff, Leonard Goldenson, Howard K. Smith, Arlene Francis, and Martin Locke.